Hi, yeah, thanks Ben for organising this. Um, no mean feat, getting everybody actually in the room, which is absolutely lovely, and I recognise quite a few faces. So I'm going to mainly talk about bi-directional intimate partner violence uh, today, and we're all going to touch on sort of models and uh, sort of like traditional understandings and how things are hopefully moving forward. So this is still the sort of predominant model within the UK uh, in terms of a, um, a passive, non-aggressive female victim and a male uh, perpetrator being very aggressive, uh, supposedly you know, unwarranted, motivated by patriarchal uh, beliefs around his right to be uh, dominant in the relationship. And this is a model which fits with where domestic abuse sits, which is in the violence against women and girls strategy. Um, so this implies that this is all part of gender-based violence. So people, vi uh, men are violent to women in a relationship because they are women. That's the gender-based violent idea. But what we've known for many, many years is actually, if we look at violent relationships, we find that the most common presentation is one where both men and women use aggression in the relationship. So we, it's called bi-directionally aggressive. Now this doesn't say that they're both primary aggressors, there's a primary aggressor of a victim, there's a lot of nuance there. But generally this is the most common. And interestingly the second most common is actually female to male aggression. Um, and you can see that whether you find uh, the rates of violence in a population depends on who you sample. So obviously if you're looking at treatment samples, refuse samples, you're going to get almost you know, the vast majority of relationships reporting physical aggression. Um, quite high in school and colleges, 40% community samples, but again a lot of these are in uh, at-risk populations, so it's probably higher than you find in a general population. Uh, where they're more like 16%. Crime surveys always underestimate prevalence of part violence for a multitude of reasons. Many of the hard to reach people, maybe many of the couples are most at risk, are not sampled, not accessed. Um, there's a lovely longitudinal study that has people asked one day about crime victimisation and asked about intimate partner violence and then the day after they ask about relationship problems and the difference between the two in prevalence is stark. So men and women, when asked about criminal victimisation, do not readily think of partner violence. And it is particularly uh, the case for men. Men do not see the violence that their partners use against them as domestic abuse. And it's not surprising because of how it's framed. So this study, so this was a systematic review of all the research up to 2011, and it was published in 2012. And research since that has pretty much found the same thing. So bi-directional intimate partner violence is the most common form of aggression between intimate partners. We have to be careful when we're looking at single sex populations that are sampled because what we know is victim offender overlap is found but what we find is the person reporting the aggression tends to report more aggression back than their partner says they use and less aggression than their partner says they use and we find this across the board we also find it for lots of negative behaviours, it's, it's a general human trait. You downplay your own negative traits and you upplay somebody else's, particularly if your negative traits are directed at them. It's just a natural thing. We see it across economics reporting and all sorts of things. It's not uh, immune to, it's, it's general, it's not an aggression specific trend. So post uh, 2011 we're finding exactly the same pattern. Um, bi-directionally being most common, women generally uh, using more physical aggression um, in Western countries and interestingly, and this has been found time and time again and it has real repercussions for how we assess risk in domestic abuse, is bi-directionally aggressive relationships are also the most aggressive. And they lend support to us actually starting to look at 
intimate partner violence from a family systems perspective is what I would argue, rather than a gendered, informed feminist lens. We probably all, I don't know if we still do the adverts, but we used to had all the uh, adolescent violence adverts with the, the boy sort of like hitting behind the screen, being violent to his girlfriend, and all sort of violence around boys being aggressive to girls. But again, the pattern of similarity between boys and girls is stark, as always been the case when you ask boys and girls. Girls tend to report using more aggression than boys to their partners. Um, girl, uh, boys report having more aggression uh, directed to them by their partners. But then again, we're still seeing a lot of bi-directional uh, intimate partner violence. So our awareness campaigns, but we're, waste, we're not wasting, we're spending our taxpayer money on, need to reflect the reality. We need to reflect the reality. I have four daughters. I'm very invested in protecting women uh, and daughters, and I've brought all my daughters up to never, ever hit boys. Don't hit boys because, boys don't hit you because they're chivalrous, and they've been taught not to hit girls. But if you hit a boy, then maybe he decides that's not the case, and you're not going to come off best. Even like pushing aside the moral argument, you shouldn't, just for your own self-protection, do not hit boys. And we need to be saying this to girls. And domestic abuse, intimate partner violence, is not just a heterosexual problem. So again, this is a challenge to a model that says it's around male patri patriarchy, when we find the research suggests that lesbian relationships are the most aggressive relationships of all types of relationships. So reviews of the literature find about half of same-sex and sexual minority relationships experience uh, domestic abuse from both partners. And it is significantly where you are victimised, the association is significant for perpetration. So where you have a victim of domestic abuse, you need to be exploring their own use of aggression. And that is not to blame somebody, that is not to make someone feel bad or to negate their victimisation experience, is to fully understand what is going on here. So have things changed? How did we start in the 60s with Ellen Pizzi? I love the look there. She's like, has it changed? It's a perfect picture, isn't it? Hmm. Um, the feminist movement was massive. The whole left wing politics, there was left wing terrorism, everything was going on in the 60s and 70s. It was a very volatile and some would say exciting time. There was a real opportunity for change. And Ellen saw an opportunity and a need where she was trying to help women who had been abused by their partners uh, and offering a safe haven for the women and the children to escape that abuse, to give them a breathing space, time to heal, time to recover. But from that very first ever refuge in the whole world, Ellen Pizzi told me personally this, and we published it as well. It actually took her 35 years to get published. I had to get an edit. I was an editor of a journal that actually published it eventually. Of the first 100 women who entered the refuge, 60% were as violent as the men they had left. And these women were violent to their partners, and in the refuge they were fighting with other women, and they were also violent to their children. They were generally violent women. And what she noted was, similar to the men they left, is these women came from what we would call now adverse childhood experiences. They came from troubled families where there was a lot of abuse, neglect, substance abuse, and so forth suggesting that it, even at the very beginning, was never about gender. It's not that as women's lives move forward, women have become more empowered to use aggression. It's always been the case. It's not about sexual politics. So there's lots of terms you can use for bi-directional <coughs> intimate partner violence. And myself, I'm guilty too. Most of us probably don't nail it down well enough. So when I talk about it, all I'm talking about is, at the basic sense, both partners use intimate partner violence. But it could be, some define it as, where a victim says that they use aggression first. So that's another way of defining it. It doesn't matter how you define it, you need to be clear how you are defining it, that's all. It could be a primary aggressor, primary victim. This is something that came out a lot in the US. Uh, 
So when police started saying, look, what do we do? When we said arrest, uh, mandatory arrest, the police in America started arresting both partners, and that caused a lot of upset amongst a lot of people. So they were encouraged to say who's the primary aggressor and who's the primary victim. That's a, one way of looking at it. Uh, work that I did for my PhD um, and other people picked up as well and worked as well it was around Michael Johnson's typology where you've got common couple violence which is low level, low coercion, violence between both partners, mutual violent control, two very controlling and violent partners, intimate terrorism, one controlling violent partner and one non-controlling but violent partner and violent resistance where the uh, the, oh no, actually intimate terrorism and violent resistance are sort of sisters, so you can be violent towards your intimate terrorist, and, but it's seen as resistance, you're resisting the oppression of that person. But essentially, anyone who does typologies knows, as soon as you create one, somebody will divide it and divide it, and it's like a fractal. It goes round and round, you keep going deeper and deeper. So essentially, I think we've just got to say, look, violence is on a continuum, Control is on a continuum, and you've got two people in a relationship. Although, you may not, you may have three or four. I don't know the terms for all these things, because I'm too old to keep up. <laughs> but there may be multiple people, but they're all on this continuum. And even where we looked at these categories, Monique, uh, they still found that about 20% were intimate terrorism and 20% mutual violent control. So it's suggesting even if, uh, you know, no matter what we're doing, Mutual violent control suggests that in a lot of relationships where we're saying the guy's the perpetrator, he's an intimate terrorist, his partner is also an intimate terrorist. That's what mutual violent control is. And then, now we get to dynamic typologies, which I've just done one of these for, we've done a couple of home office uh, funded projects on child to parent aggression, and we've been looking at dyna dyna dynamic typologies <coughs> and things change over time a lot. So what we find, they find is, uh, aggressive behaviour often starts with one member of the couple um, being violent, but then over time the less aggressive individual becomes more aggressive. The aggressive individual maintains their aggression and you get this stable, aggressive uh, relationship. And actually, over time, most aggression goes depletes. Older people are just less aggressive, maybe we can't get out of the chairs fast enough, I don't know, but definitely <laughs> aggression generally, street violence, any sort of violence tends to reduce as you get older. Now that can then go back up when you get a lot older, because then there's the stresses of age, there's a big disparity of age between uh, partners as well, so there's a whole literature on elder abuse as well, which sometimes is a continuation and sometimes is new because of the stresses of that ageing process. So, what are the need factors for uh, bi-directional intimate partner violence? Because this is what I care about. I work clinically. I came from this as a victim of coercive control, non-violent, I might add. So I was your quintessential victim. I could have been the poster girl and came from a feminist perspective for about three years of my PhD. And eventually I had to think, doesn't actually fit. And since then, I've been really wanting to make a difference by understanding what is going on and therefore addressing it in real life. So we need to think what are the factors that are at play with these bi-directional individuals. So we know that they tend to have problems in their upbringings. So they tend to have something called conduct disorder, which is where there's that rule breaking, antisocial, all of antisocial behaviour, sometimes higher level. It's a precursor to personality disorder and psychopathy, but most don't go on to be personality disordered. But you see this in the uh, timeline of men and women identified as having violent relationships. This is a longitudinal study, so they actually followed these from childhood. So they knew what these men and women were like when they were teenagers, <coughs> and then when they got into relationships, they went back to say what predicted that violent relationship. And this was this conduct disorder and they talked of these partners, they're more likely to become involved with violent partners. It makes sense because people who aren't violent, most of them will not stick, stick around forever. I certainly stuck around quite a long time longer than I should have, but eventually I always had my mind, I'm getting out, I'm going to get out, I'm going to get out, and I did. 
but regardless of whether or not their partners hit them, they hit their partners. And that was for men and women. So if it's stable, and this is actually a sign often out of adverse childhood experiences exposure, which leads to that difficulty in, in fitting in and actually uh, being able to manage school and so forth, and often needing to be out of the house a lot. Mental health. Uh, what we find is those related, uh, involved in bi-directional, the severity of prevalence is highest among them in bi-directional and the intimate partner violence, lowest uh, uh, with them not. And what we're finding is for mental health, drug use, suicidality, depression, relationship satisfaction, these are the factors that are driving and related. And they're both probably precursors, maintainers and outcomes. Five. Partner psychopathology. So this is another longitudinal study. They uh, these are massive names in the regression research literature. Absolutely, heroes of mine. They say partners' antisocial behaviour and depression are significantly associated to both using intimate partner violence. And the findings suggest both partners' levels of psychopathology increase the levels of partner abuse. And so it's important to consider aggression-associated psychopathology for both partners. We need to assess both partners if we want to know how to work with violent couples. Or a couple where there's one partner is violent and the other one isn't. The Dove study was a European study. They found the same thing. Quality of life, mental health, quality of life among female victims and male and females involved in intimate partner violence as both victims and perpetrators, so you're bi-directional, is much lower. <coughs> Substance use, all over bi-directional. So you've got uh, methamphetamine, marijuana use, uh, alcohol use, uh, you've also got problem gambling. These things aren't about patriarchy. These things are about uh, psychopathology, adversity, failure to socialise children sufficiently, not having a nurturing home life. And we find the same for same-sex couples. So for, this was one of, there's not a lot, there's a lot less research on same-sex couples, but here, this is exactly what I'm finding with a systematic review I'm doing on intimate partner violence generally, is that people get emotionally distressed, they drink to cope, and then the drink reduces their inhibitions, narrows their focus, increases the resentment, unhappiness they've got, and it leads to aggression. Often people drink together. I work clinically, I work with victims and perpetrators, and alcohol during COVID has been massive. The amount of child protection cases that are coming because people had nothing to do but go and buy alcohol and sit in the living rooms and drink for two years is really massive. It is a time bomb. Why it matters. Right. So to assess risk, perpetration by one partner is the strongest predictor of perpetration by another partner and it's also the most important risk factor for injurious IPV. It should be on every dash risk assessment. Nope. It should be on every assessment. We use it and there was an absolute folly across Manchester when we even suggested asking does your partner use aggression also. What's interesting is I work with both victims and perpetrators separately and I ask them the same questions. And who's more honest about this? Men. Women say hey, I'm not aggressive and knows my partner. And the guys say, yeah, I'm aggressive, and she is too. It's interesting, isn't it? So you do need to ask both partners, because maybe one of them is going to actually tell you what's going on. So we know that if you only care about women, and some people do only care about women, and that's fine, everyone's got their things. That, as, long as, as long as somebody's caring for everyone, we're fine. But if you only care about women, you have to look bi-directional because it is the best predictor. And I care about kids, having got four kids, and I think if, of anyone, if anyone is the most innocent person part in this, it's the children. And bi-directional abuse is the one that impacts positive parenting the most. These young people have no safe parent to go to. They are trapped with two parents who are fighting, and they are just bystanders, sometimes intermediaries and often uh, victims directly as well. If you don't treat both cases, 
a misuse data from uh, an evaluation of one of my, uh, my program in the strength, they said where the guy had done the program and done really well, they still couldn't move the child off the uh, child protection case because the partner still had worrying behaviour, but there was nowhere to send the partner beyond the uh, feeding program, which is not a therapeutic program. So the partners were stuck. They were stuck. The, the, the male had done the programme, it was worked, but the children were still on this child protection plan and may end up going into care, which nobody do you think is a good outcome. <coughs> so both men, members of the couple need to address their unhealthy behaviours, particularly if they want to stay together. And do you know what? When you do that, this is some, uh, a quote from a couple. I think that just in terms of my hopefulness about the whole thing and about my husband's willingness to be here and learn something, and the husband saying separately, yeah, you know, it's just positive to work on something together. We're both talking, we're ta taking the time now to talk. Having both partners participating in a program is really important. And we're getting this again and again. The partners are saying, I'm talking to my partner about this, like using opposite emotions to manage my emotions. They understand what they're each doing and they're supporting each other. So bidirectional IPV is the most common type and it can look very different. I would say never profile somebody. Don't profile on gender, don't profile on sex, race, age, anything. Be aware there's that massive continuum. You don't know where they are. Try and make a safe space where people can be honest with you, where you're not jumping on them. And like, I'd lo love it if the criminal justice system could just back off a little bit and maybe allow a little bit of therapeutics in before we go in. I know it's a bit controversial. I think we need to treat relationship factors if they choose to stay together, the couple, and forcing people apart just means they stay together and don't tell you. That's all it is. You're just increasing risk for children. Or if they are co-parenting, because as Ben says, the stuff that comes out in co-parenting, all that resentment, it comes out and the children suffer. And I, I know, and certainly the work from America said, and I don't do conjoint, I do do it separately, but you can treat couples conjoint together if it's safe to do so. There's good procedures, we shouldn't be afraid of trying something different. Because as anyone who's looked at the actual outcome data knows, the current programmes don't work. Me.